Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, how the heck are you doing? Trying to think of what I want to tell you. (laughs) Jen and I just finished recording and I jump right in to do the intro and outro and I often forget specifically what we talk about, but this episode is really about How do we tune in and focus on what you're needing internally? That so much of what we learn is how to meet milestones and be productive and to achieve and the more, more, more. And how as deep thinkers and deep feelers, do you learn to really tune into what you need and to set goals for yourself that are very manageable where you can succeed? And if you're someone like me who has this wound of not enough, the part of what we're talking about is how do you joyfully move your body? And if you're in resistance, the resistance is okay. And all of the ways that we've been conditioned to try and meet these milestones. And we often feel inadequate because it feels like the goal is to achieve more and more and more. And if you're someone who loves to move your body and this isn't an issue, but we talk about how do you navigate with the gremlins? How do you deal with those days when you should push and the days when you should rest? And how do you honor yourself? I think this is something that I would expect that many of you have experienced. And I don't know that it's what we always talk about. This is not about exercise, but it's really about finding ways to be joyful in what you choose to do and how do you rumble with the resistance, with the gremlins? How do you set realistic expectations, realistic goals? And how do you really learn to honor yourself no matter where you're at? I think it's a very helpful episode. And it's something that over the years I've continued to work on and has really created more ease for me than it has in the past. And so if you're struggling or you're feeling bad or angry with yourself, we talk about how do you bring in self-compassion and acceptance so that you can really love yourself no matter what. And then I'm imagining some of you rolling your eyes and going, that's totally impossible. (laughs) Anyways, now onto the show. Hey, Jen. How are you? Hi, Patricia. I'm good, thanks. How are you, my dear? I think I'm okay. I don't know. I think I'm fine. (laughs) Yeah, me too. You? Yeah. You know, it's so funny. Exactly. I've just worked for the past like five hours and now I'm like, how am I? No, I'm good Mm -hmm. though. I feel my body's a little tight. I could probably use a nice stretch. I'll do that after. Mm -hmm. I have to stay out of the pool for four days. I just had something removed on my body, so... I can paddle, but it's been raining. So it's nice. I've gotten to a point where I really know that movement makes me feel good. It's not like having to exercise because I need to burn calories or it's good for me. It makes me feel good. So it's just interesting. We'll see how the next couple of days go and if I'm able to find someone to paddle with. I hope that you can. And I really hope, I'm just going to voice this now, that in a couple of weeks, I don't know, maybe a month, I will be able to engage this conversation with you <laughs> from a very different place. Yeah. I know I said I don't make New Year's resolutions and I'm still going to stick to that, but you've inspired me for a while to really find something that gives my body that stretch and movement. I mean, as human beings, we're really meant to move around. And mm-hmm. as you can imagine, sitting in, as you know, in our profession, we do an awful lot of sitting. Yeah. And I don't know how many other people got messages. My dad was an exercise bulimic and was so afraid about me being overweight. And I was a chubby kid. And it felt like his motivation for having me move was so that I wouldn't be fat. And I made that. And and I think for many of us that have the profile of you can't make me, you're not the boss of me, that ended up really hurting me because it didn't feel like he was seeing me and wanting to move because it was, you know, as a kid, I loved riding my bike and roller skating, but because he wanted me to do things that felt risky and scary to me, I didn't do them. And then I felt like a failure and a disappointment. It created this power struggle where I really, it's possible that I could have ended up being far more active growing up and loving myself and loving moving. But this 
dynamic between us really spoiled things. So if any of you have that resistance, if you can't make me, you're not the boss of me, or we're so tied to diet culture or having to count steps or burn calories, these tools that we have are great for getting information, but it's really about what makes you feel good, what brings you joy, what makes you happy. There are times, like I was swimming yesterday, it was raining, it was in the 50s and it was raining, it's an outdoor pool, but I knew I wanted to get in and move my body. I didn't know I wouldn't be able to get in the pool for a couple of days, but what does it take to get to that point where you just know that it makes you feel better and you wanna do it? There's resistance, it's not always perfect, and if you're in a place where you're struggling, I wanna be sensitive to that. And for being a fat kid who resisted exercise for so long, it's been really empowering to see myself as I'm athletic and I love moving my body and I paddled over 600 miles in 2022 because I wanted to. Yeah, I love how you're saying about joyful movement and it should feel good in your body. And there, if you think of it, like there's so many different ways to move. Like there's so many different ways to be active. And you know, what works for one person isn't going to work for another person. And I am in that space where I'm struggling with it. And yeah. you know, my life, it's been I kind of back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes I'm good with it. Sometimes I'm, life just kind of takes over. And, and I also want to just kind of join with you. I think I was maybe almost 30 mm-hmm. before I had a sense of myself as athletic. Right. You know, and having that type of, I'm just going to call it power Mm -hmm. and that my body can do amazing things. And it's funny. So right now I know sometimes we put a lot of things on us. Like sometimes it's age, right? Like, or, and I know for me, like I could be in a better place physically a couple of years from now, older than I am right now. Right. And it's just that kind of paying attention and finding the joy in it and knowing that as a human being, it's kind of your birthright. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you can find it on your terms, it's wonderful. Yeah. I think one of the things that happens that makes it really difficult for people to, if they're in, and for me, when I've been in the stuck place of getting started, because I feel like then I have to do a lot. And we can look at what brings you joy and movement. And is it stretching? Is it yoga? Is it walking? Is it sitting by the river. I mean, there are all kinds of things that you can do, but can your goal be that you put on your shoes and you walk out your front door? Can you start with a goal that you cannot fail with? And it's interesting what I've, I have a friend that Erica, who was on the podcast, I don't know what episode it was. She's very athletic, but she was talking about how her body needed rest and not needing to work out so hard. And I was sore all the time. And I thought that was normal. And it, was pain. And in water fitness, I was probably going at 100%. And then I'd come home and I'd need to sleep. My body would hurt. I'd be really tired. And after talking with Eric, I thought, okay, I'm going to dial it back. So I, I probably work at about 75%. And I will tell you almost every single time I'm in the pool, I have this, you're not working hard enough. You're taking it too easy. This doesn't count for anything. And it ends up being the perfect amount of exercise for me that my body doesn't hurt. I don't get that restlessness. And I'm sharing this because I think that many of us that have wounding have this not enough. Whatever we do, it never feels like enough. And I have a friend who tells me, you're so busy and you do so much. I feel like, how can I be? When I get my screen time report from my phone, I have a full-time job for being on my phone. How can I be busy? And I'm sharing this because I think that we have these internal gremlins and if we don't know that they're normal and recognize that it's okay to have those, you're not doing enough, you should be doing more, it should be longer, it should be faster, it should be more intense, that what I know is I need to get to the pool and I need to move my body. And because I've had this shoulder injury, I haven't been doing certain things. I'm allowed to use T-Rex arms in the pool. I can't use anything with full extended arms. So I use my little T-Rex arms and I'm not doing any of this stuff with weights from my arms and shoulders. Letting that be enough. And how do we get to that place where we can give ourselves permission for doing what we can and knowing that it's enough to get off of that? Well, it should have been longer. It should have been more. It should have been harder to really dial in and trust that we can trust our bodies. And Jenna, I've told, I've told you a couple times, a couple times, like I'm eating like an unsupervised child and not making the best food choices, not feeling great, waking up in the middle of the night, waking up in the morning and then repeating and doing it again and finding compassion that I know that I go through periods where 
I don't make the best food choices. I don't exercise consistently. And I think we have that fear of whatever that catastrophic thinking, and I, I don't mean to be fat phobic in saying this, but I think that this is what comes up. I'm going to gain weight. I'm going to get out of control. I have to stay on myself. That really hard, unkind way of driving. And can we rest when we need to rest? And when we have times when we eat like an unsupervised child, can we do that? And trust that we will find our balance because we almost always do. But the difference is that narrative of beating ourselves up and making ourselves feel terrible for being human. Yeah, absolutely. Ah, but yeah, wait. <laughs> <laughs> what you said. <laughs> what you said. <laughs> so for the listener, we don't normally let you know what's going on, but Jen has dogs. I have dogs. And this is a day where Jen's dogs are barking. And so she goes to say something and then the dogs are barking and she has to pause and then pause and pause. And the editor takes out all the dog barking. But then by the time you come back, you forgot what you were going to say. So I remember now. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to just join you in some of that, like the no pain, no gain, right? Like right. all of these cultural messages that we get. And I don't know which podcast episode it was that you and I did that where the major theme was question everything, mm -hmm. you know, just question everything. Like, really, does it have to be this way? Yeah. And I like to say to clients and students when I used to be a mindfulness teacher, a meditation teacher, like your practice is going to be as individual as your fingerprint, like find what works for you. And one of my favorite ways to do that is just to really question everything. Well, what if what could count, you know, walking down to the driveway, like what would feel good? I know I had the experience just the other day, got out of bed and I stretched mm -hmm. like straight up, like total cartoon character <laughs> making up kind of a stretch. And it was glorious. It really felt delicious. And, you know, if we could kind of center our sense of joy, our sense of pleasure, Right. Mm -hmm. Like do it, find what feels good. I know as a, I think a yoga instructor is using that right now. I keep getting that in my email box. And to let your heart, your body, your muscles like guide you. And it's not fun to do it in a way that's going to be pressured or you're trying to outrun something, right? You're being chased by the bear as opposed to, oof, I want to do this because it's delicious and it feels good. Right. And there are times when I don't want to go to the pool and I don't want to paddle and I know that it's good for me and that structure really works for me. But that comes from a place of kindness, not from a place of fear or anger. Oh, you're bad if you don't go. You're going to be lazy if you don't. You're going to gain weight if you don't. You're going to feel terrible if you don't. It's like, I know that I feel better when I do these things and it's good for me and it's part of what my self-care is. So how do we learn how to navigate those gremlins? And what one day, what maybe self-care is to push and another day maybe to go, Whew, I'm tired today, my body needs to rest. And really learning how do we focus in? And it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to go and go like, oh, today was a day I really should have rested. Or you rest and you go, oh, today was a day I really should have gone. Can we rumble with all of that and not being perfect and allowing ourselves to be imperfectly human and trusting that? Yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, two thoughts in response. One is we almost had a little experiment in my home. I love my co-parenting partner. <laughs> my ex-husband is wonderful and we're doing such a good job together now. So I hope if he hears this, he's not offended by me sharing this story. But we had this thing with the kids and he's very, for all everything you just listed, like in hopefully the vast majority of the time in a very positive way. But with the kids, it was, okay, come on, we got to do this. We got to do it. We got to do it. And it's all, it's all love. It's all care and concern. But the kids often, and they're kids, right? These are, <laughs> you know, my inner parts, young parts, sometimes showing up as gremlins, you know, but it's that inner young one in there. And they, they would resist. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. And he and I would have some conversations about this. And so we didn't do it on purpose, but an experiment happened to happen where I would be like, okay, guys, I'm going out for a walk. Do you want to come? And at first they didn't really want to come. And it was funny. I think that was the time when I would polo you. I would have mm -hmm. this like time by myself and it was really nice. But then after that, when they were not 
when it wasn't my will, right? It was like that counter will got kicked up. No, I'm not mm-hmm. going. You're not the boss of me. You know, after maybe two or three times, like I didn't go on a walk by myself for the longest time because they really wanted to come with me because they didn't, it was a choice. So it's that free choice. And I think giving ourselves the same kind of choice, right? And we're not, I know I fight with myself all the time. You know, it's like, (laughs) you're not the boss of me. Wait, what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's just me. (laughs) Uh, It's so funny. So there's something very, there's something very real to that. And then the second thing I wanted to say was again about this like no pain, no gain, like this tendency in our culture. It's like, go, go harder, go further, go, you know, we're very competitive. Like, and look, there's nothing wrong, especially if you're an athlete or even if you're not a formal athlete to wanting to do like your break your PR, right? Your personal record. And it's fun. And can it not be like the only speed we ever run on? And I know for me, things like my Apple watch or a Fitbit or things that measure these types of things, I love that kind of stuff and I hate it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Recently, I have found a new one, new to me anyway, called the Aura Ring. And what I love about that and what I find that's different is there is an emphasis on rest. There is an emphasis on, hey, you worked a little too hard. Let's back off and give your body some time to recover or, you know, you didn't sleep well or your heart rate's elevated, your temperature's elevated. It gives you so much data. It's amazing. It's really comfortable. I love the thing. This emphasis on listening to your body, taking care of yourself. It was so refreshing. Yeah. I think that those things can be, it can work either way. And I remember when I had a Fitbit that I was getting ready for bed and a colleague had a few more steps than I did. And I'm in my bedroom, in my pajamas, marching because of that competitive nature. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, yeah. (laughs) It's everywhere. It's in all of us all the time. You should see how it showed up in my meditation at some point. It's like, I can sit longer and more still than anyone. (laughs) Right, right. And some of that works for us and some of it doesn't. And sometimes that's a self-care thing to do that. And other times it's not. It's interesting. I posted my mileage on my Facebook page. I, I paddled 606, probably a little bit more than that miles last year kayaking. And somebody put on my page, you're going to go for 700 this year. And I'm like, no. And the truth is that I paddled almost 700 miles from August to August. And now that I'm doing water fitness, like I don't have that drive to get as many miles as I can. And now it's about listening. So there are times when we want to use these as markers to inspire or to motivate or to set goals. And then it's also okay to go this year, I'm going to listen to my body and I'm just going to show up when my body wants to, and that's okay. Do you have the flexibility to make those adjustments? And when you need structure or to push, you can do that. But when your body says that's enough, we need to rest. Do you have the flexibility to do that and really listen and honor your honor your body? And that's a tough one. And our society does not promote rest and listening to yourself. It's all about more, more, more. Yeah. And I, I, oh, I mean, I do think that that just causes so much more pain then I mean it does have its place and like everything it depends and question everything you know but I think we have to pay attention to the seasons I know that for me paying attention to my cycle was really important in so many ways not just for what type of exercise do I feel like doing or want to do or my body needs but also like other things as like productivity you know it's like there's that one week in the month where it's like really like resting and chilling out so that I'm more energized for the weeks where I do have more energy makes more sense, you know, so really pay attention. So much of what our society is about is external, setting external goals, being productive, doing these things. And so much of the work that I do with my clients is internal work. What are you needing? What would be nurturing to you? How do you turn inward and trust that and to let go of what these external markers are? The other two points are resistance is okay. We can get really curious about resistance. And in being in physical therapy, the PT gave me this exercise and you're supposed to do it with like a broomstick and I was doing it without. And I told him that and he explained to me why it was important to use the broomstick. And I'm like, I just need that information. If I don't have the information that I don't know what to do. And as I'm getting ready to wrap up PT, I have a whole range of exercises that I'm supposed to be doing. And I do them, not all of them, not consistently. 
so A, I could be beating myself up for that because I'm not showing up perfectly and I'm not doing everything and I'm not getting the max. And when I go, he works me for an hour and I'm exhausted. But I was thinking about what are the exercises that I consistently do because I like them and they feel good. And maybe asking him for what are the top three exercises you would recommend? Because the reality is I'm not going to do all of these exercises once I stop. It's just not feasible. So what three, like three things a day I could do. And hopefully there are three things that I enjoy doing. So I was thinking I could even say, these are the ones that I really enjoy doing. If you were going to recommend three or five, which ones would you recommend? And I can always rotate in one or two that I'm not as crazy about. I think it's really helpful when we can give ourselves permission to figure out what's doable as opposed to him giving me a list and saying, do these things. And then I don't do any of them because I don't like them. They're hard. They're not my favorites. It's too much. I get overwhelmed. So it's really okay to start with something that seems like it's a ridiculously small goal, but you cannot fail it that it is that simple. And that's how we build up confidence. But we feel like it doesn't matter and we don't do it. And we want to do something that's really significant, but we can't maintain it and it's not sustainable. Do you see these patterns going on in your life? And I can imagine somebody going, yes, but what's the point if it's not a significant, like, why would I just want to pick one little thing? That's nothing. It's not enough but that's how we build patterns and habits that feel good that we love as opposed to driving ourselves to do things that don't serve us. Yeah. Or will set us back, right. Or injure us. Or Mm -hmm. I know I've had, (laughs) you know, I've had those things happen. I know one metaphor that I've heard about that is, and I, I don't know how to sail a boat. So I don't, this isn't from a completely uninformed place, but you know, if you're navigating a ship and you're just like one degree off course, Mm -hmm. that that's going to make a really big difference. Sure, maybe not over the course of the next hour. Mm -hmm. But if what we're looking at is, you know, across days, weeks, months, years, it makes a big difference. And it is something that will be cumulative, right? And I would say along with like going, like I'm on, I'm off, I'm on, I'm off. If you can see that as a natural part of it too, Mm -hmm. right? That there's this ebb and flow because... What is it, Ave, the ab- abstinence violation effect, right? It's, oh, forget it, you know, or just that that tendency to just be all or nothing or just to give up. But yeah, these small incremental changes in, in, in anything. You know, I was working with a coach once who told me, she's so brilliant, I love this woman. She told me, turtle steps, right? Like you will get things done, whether it's writing a book or set, starting a meditation practice or, you know, finding joyful movement that you're going to do on a really, on a regular basis. Think of the smallest step you can take in that direction, do half of it. (laughs) Right. Right. And it'll build. And and especially if you can have fun with it. And at least if you're not having fun with it, try to have a sense of humor Mm -hmm. (laughs) about it and question, you know, question this tendency because we're all products of a culture, this tendency to be serious, be driven, be always productive, always heading in that straight arrow upward. I mean, that type of unsustainability is hurting us on so many levels. And that's not what recovery or progress looks like. It's up, down, it squiggles around and back, that it's not linear at all. And when we can know that, I think that that just creates so much more peace because we have this expectation that it should look a certain way and we can't understand why we're not meeting that goal. One of the things that you and I had talked about when I was going through a really difficult time and we often, I've had this expectation, I'm feeling irritable and I figure I'm going to go exercise and then I'm going to get relief because I often do. And then I don't, and I feel really bad because the expectation is I'm going to do this thing and then I'm going to feel better and I don't. And I remember going through a rough period where just things were hard and I continued to paddle and I went to water fitness and I was doing the things that I know make me feel good and I was still not feeling much better. And sometimes that's part of when you talk about this ebb and flow, that sometimes things really flow and they gel and we feel great for what we're doing. And other times we do our self-care, we still don't feel good and that's okay. And having that awareness, it stinks having the awareness of I'm doing the things that I know how to do and I still am not getting a lot of relief from it, but I'm not so identified with it that I'm in it and I just feel like everything is miserable. So that's the other part of this, that you may end up doing the thing that you want to do and you may not feel better. And can that be okay? Can you find compassion for knowing that you're doing the things that you think are going to make you feel better and they don't? And can you continue to do them? 
because as Jen is talking about this ebb and flow, I think of waves, you know, you think of the wave going up and the wave going down and up and down. And it's great when that wave is going up, but when it goes down, it doesn't feel so great. But can you just persist and ride it through knowing that you will hit the top of that wave again and you will drop back down again? It's kind of like the weather, right? Like we can't always, well, unless you live in San Diego and it's beautiful every single day and it rains so infrequently you forget how to use your <laughs> Sorry, just had to throw that in there. But that it's it's going to be like the weather, and some it's just not always going to be there the way we want it to be there. Yeah, yeah. I was following Jen the other day. I was driving, and because it rains so infrequently, I kind of was forgetting. Like, where's the setting where you can set how quickly or slowly the windshield wipers go? Because it just doesn't rain enough. I think the final thing I want to end with, which is not significant, but I was listening to this person who talks about health and fitness. And they were saying, if you live in an area where the weather doesn't permit being outdoors year round to do your fitness, and you really are committed to being, having, having a lifestyle that honors your health, that it's really important to find ways to continue to move your body when the weather is inclement and you can't get out outdoors if that's what you're normally accustomed to doing. And that really made sense to me. And I, I think it is harder, you know, Jen, you live back East where it's snowing and it's freezing and Basically, except for the rain, we can pretty much do what we want year round. But how can you? It figure- rains for two weeks solid. <laughs> <laughs> I, <know. laughs> oh, I couldn't deal with that. But how can you find things that you enjoy doing in small ways? If you like yoga, there's yoga with Adrian. I hear she's amazing. It's on YouTube. It's free. She is amazing. Yeah. You can dance in your home. There's all kinds of online things that you can find for yoga or fitness or hit workouts, you know, just be creative and five minutes. Can you do five minutes? Yeah. I mean, I would even say like combining it with things that you do around your house anyway. Mm -hmm. When I'm doing, when I'm on it, like I'll even do those, you know, you kind of go up on your toes and then go down Mm -hmm. and do a little like workout for your calves, like while I'm brushing my teeth. Right. I wanted to mention too, as we've been talking a really, a good book, it's been a long time since I read it. I should probably break it out because it would probably help me right now (laughs) is Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's a really good book for building, you know, building things. And I, I, and unfortunately I'm not remembering anything about it right now other than that I enjoyed it and there's information in that. I should probably pick it up again. Sure. Sure. (laughs) All right, Jen, you got to go get your kid. Mm, I do. Thanks for being together. It was nice. Have a great day. (laughs) All right. Bye. Bye. Hey again. So I'm curious to know what you thought about that. I think there's so much power. You have to be able to say no in order to say yes. And how many of you really struggle with that sense of you're not the boss of me and wanting to have that sense of power and autonomy. And when we get off our own backs, we can show up for ourselves, but we often internalize those rigid parents or caregivers who we felt like were bossing us around all the time and we fight back. It's like shadow boxing, but nobody's there. And is that serving you? I don't know. Anyways, if any of this resonates for you, if you want to work with either Jen or me, if you struggle with perfectionism, with setting goals, with not feeling great about yourself, wanting to figure out what you want to be doing in your life, if you struggle with relationships or neurodiversity or ADHD, executive functioning, these are things that Jen and I would love to help you learn to thrive with however you're wired. If you want to reach out to Jen, you can reach her at jen at heartfulnessconsulting.com or you can reach out to me at unapologeticallysensitive.com. If you reach out to me, please make sure to check your spam email. I almost always respond by email and it's not uncommon for my email. It comes from unapologetically sensitive at gmail.com to get into your spam folders. So if you've reached out to me in the past and you thought you never heard back from me, I'm really good at responding. I obviously make a mistake every once in a while, but I do respond and my emails often end up in spam. (laughs) I think that's all I have. I hope you are doing well. I hope you are thriving. I hope this new year is bringing some freshness and some peace, joy, creativity. If you're struggling, it's okay to struggle. It's all okay. We're human. I think that's it. Remember, sensitivity is your superpower. Have a blessed day.